Hi, everyone. I'm Wiley Blevins. I'm the associate publisher at Raycraft Books, and I'd like to welcome you to our spring summer 2021 list. Raycraft Books is dedicated to publishing books by authors and illustrators from underrepresented communities. We are just over a year old, and I would like to celebrate some of our stars from the previous year. Woodpecker Girl was named one of the 24 best picture books of 2020 by School Library Journal. This is a book about a little girl with cerebral palsy based on a true story. She is trapped in her wheelchair. She has difficulties communicating with the world outside her. And one of her teachers straps a paintbrush to a band around her head and teaches her how to paint. And it opens her up. It frees her to express herself. It is a beautifully written and beautifully illustrated story. Dan Dan's Dream was named one of the 100 best picture books of 2020 by Kirkus, and the reviewer described this as pure fantasy at its best. Both books also received starred reviews. We had several additional starred review books. If you haven't seen these, I encourage you to take a look at each and every one of them. The first book that you see, Lemon Butterfly, the reviewer said that this book reimagines the potential of picture book art. We love books that tell important stories, but also are visually exciting for our young readers. We've also had a few books that have won awards, both Spotted Tale and The Reluctant Storyteller were named Best Books of the Year by American Indians in Children's Literature. Both books are written and illustrated by tribally enrolled Native American citizens. Uh, Spotted Tail has also won several additional awards and has been placed on state lists. Talking about state lists, It's Okay was recently named one of the five best books for preschoolers by the Colorado Library Association. Rice won the Freeman Honor for Asian Representation. And Call Me Max was just put on the American Library Association's rainbow list. Now on to our spring summer picture books. The first book I wanna share with you is called The Wooden Treasure. It's based on the true story of a young Indian chess master named Mir Malik Sultan Khan. He was known as the best chess player from Asia. And the story that you see in this particular picture book is when he began playing chess as a young child, he was discovered because someone gave him the gift of these wooden chess pieces and he was sent all over the world to compete in these tournaments for a few years. He was winning all of these tournaments and then decided one day to just walk away and go back to his life. It is a beautifully told story. And the illustrations are all this very gorgeous graphic style using only these four colors, orange, blue, black, and white. Chess is very popular right now. So I know there are a lot of young readers eager to read about Mir Malik Sultan Khan's life. Where Do Words Come From is a fascinating concept book by Stanford researcher Jeff Zwiers and illustrated by Senor Rainey from Spain. It is actually an artist collective run by Javier who you see pictured here. And it asks the question, where do words come from? Do they come from word factories, word bakeries? Are they flown in by word birds? This is a book that teachers and librarians will really love, but even more importantly, young readers will love it because if you look very closely at the illustrations, you'll see this isn't a typical tree. It's a tree created with the letters T-R-E-E. -E. The car is created with the letters C-A-R. The fish, F-I-S-H. The parrot, the bird, and so on. I've gone through this book over and over and over and I keep discovering new things. It has a, a very Where's Waldo appeal to it that young readers will absolutely love and they will want to revisit this book over and over and over. The next book is Seasonal Adventures written by Johnny Ray Moore. He is a poet and a songwriter. This is a seasonal poem book. So you see over here with Welcome to Summer, sun rays dancing, ponies prancing, kittens on their mother's back, welcome to summer. Well, I follow Johnny Ray on Facebook and he's always posting photographs of him with his children. And I realized over time that Johnny Ray's greatest love is being a father. So I thought how wonderful it would be to not only have this poetry book about the seasons, and there are a lot of seasons books out there, but to elevate it by having it also be a celebration of fatherhood, specifically African-American fatherhood, which you so rarely see in picture books. So we found an artist, Kababi Bayak, who is a muralist out of St. Louis, 
who became well known for a series of paintings he did called 365 Days with Dad. And what he has done through this book is as you read about the seasons, this father and his son are celebrating the joys of the season and celebrating their relationship together. It's a gorgeous book. The Tree Told Me is what I would describe as a philosophical book. This little girl discovers that everything she needs to know about life can be learned by watching and listening to a tree. So as she listens to this tree, she learns things like, the tree told me that we can be strong and small at the same time. The tree told me to experience the storms. And at the very end, she realizes the tree tells her that she has grown and she is ready to, to move on. It's beautifully illustrated, a very touching, moving book that looks at nature in a, a quite unique way. Valentina and Monsters, our second book by Spanish illustrator Angeles Ruiz. She also wrote this book. It is this really moving friendship story between a little girl and a monster. And then one day the monster is no more. He can't be found and the little girl realizes he's gone. So it is a book that deals with loss and grief in a really uh, touching way. I sent this book to a recent reviewer who wrote me after reading it said, I just read Valentina Monster. I'm going to go collect myself for a few hours and I'm not gonna be reading anymore. It evokes a very strong reaction in the readers, which is what its intent was. At the beginning of the book, Valentina and Monster meet. It was a very special day. Monster's first at his new cotton candy stand. The sweet scent of cotton candy floated through the forest clearing. Valentina was out walking as she did every morning to shake off the nightmares that come during sleep. Although she had eaten far too much breakfast, she could not help but search for the source of the marvelous smell. When Valentina spotted a monster surrounded by sugary pink clouds, perhaps she should have felt fear, but instead she hugged him. And that's the beginning of the relationship. Then later on the book, when, when monster is gone, Angeles writes, the unbearable silence was soon broken by the sounds of small footsteps crunching on dried leaves. The animals came from every corner of the forest to hug and hold Valentina. And then the, the subsequent pages deal with her loss and how she, how she moves on from that. Gorgeously illustrated and really important story. Woof, The Truth About Dogs is our second book in our Truth About series. The first book was Who Knew the Truth About Owls? both written by Annette Whipple. It asks all those important questions children have about dogs, like why do dogs chew shoes? Why do dogs smell butts? One of the things that makes this book so interesting is that throughout there's this woof woof section where the dog is actually speaking to the reader and it's quite, quite humorous. We have several more books coming out in this series. Book three will be Scurry, The Truth About Spiders. Book four will be Ribbit, The Truth About Frogs. And book five will be Meow, The Truth About Cats. Gorgeous photographs, really fascinating information for young readers. One Summer Night is a rhyming science picture book for very young readers. I met this author at the Florida SCBWI conference. It's a writer's conference. And I evaluated her manuscript. And normally I'm not attracted to rhyming picture books, especially nonfiction rhyming. But this book really took me by surprise because it has so much drama, so much intensity. This is the story of turtle hatchlings who have to very quickly find their way to the sea. And they follow the reflection of the moon's light on the water to know where to go. And on this particular night, the clouds cover the moon. And there's a light on a nearby porch that sends them in the wrong direction. And there are predators that are approaching and it's so filled with tension. Young readers will be flipping the pages as quickly as they can in hopes that these turtles all make it safely to the sea. Here's one spread from the book. This way turtle says the girl walking toward the sea. We're here to help you get back home. Come and follow me. The baby turtles see the light. That's where they need to go. They push each other through the sand, the smallest ones in tow. And in the back of the book, there's this beautiful photographic back matter that tells additional information about turtles and their trip to the sea and how important that is. Sunday with Safta is by Eliyahu Eric Bakoza. This is a holiday book, specifically a Jewish holiday book. 
Eliyahu Eric Bakobza, I call him Eric. He is a very famous Israeli fine artist. He does not do picture books. His art appears in museums around the world and the permanent Kness, uh, collection of the Knesset and so on. I'm a collector of Eric's art. So every time I go to Israel, I spend time with him in his studio. I've always wanted to do a children's book with him. Uh, a few years ago, he did a series of prints, a sort of semi-commercial project uh, on Jewish holidays. And I lived briefly in, in Israel and there were so many holidays they were so celebrating and I didn't know anything about them. So I'd ask people, what's this holiday about? And they would say, oh, well, we make these cookies shaped like ears, something to do with this mean guy. <laughs> so I began researching Jewish holidays and learned a great deal about them and became fascinated with Eric's prints about the holidays. So in his studio a couple of years ago, we came up with a story together, the story of a safta, that's the Hebrew word for grandma. And the safta comes to New York City, whoops, comes to New York City to visit her family. And she, and you see here, it's mixed media. There are these photographs that we have layered Eric's art onto. So she takes her son, to enjoy a Sunday together. And she's going to give him the special gift. And they end up at this museum in New York City where lo and behold, there are these holiday paintings by Eliyahu Eric Bokobza, very meta. And as they're going through the museum, she starts telling him all these stories of things that happen during these holidays, family stories that are sometimes funny, sometimes sad, sometimes really poignant. But the boy, feels like he never really got a gift that day. You flash forward a year and a half later and the family is in Jerusalem. You think they're there to visit uh, Safta, but they're really there to put a stone on her grave because it is the Jewish tradition that a year after someone passes away, you put a stone on their grave. And the boy realizes at that moment that the gift his grandmother gave him was the gift of story. Those wonderful stories that he will carry with him for the rest of his life. Sammy the Seasick Pirate by Afro-Caribbean author Janelle Springer Wilms, illustrated by Damian Jones. You might recognize his art. He does a lot of the, the Dragon Master illustrations. This is based on a true story from Barbados. Uh, Janelle is from Bar Barbados. She grew up hearing the story of a pirate named Sam Hall Lord, who was known for being a land pirate. And she always wondered how to become a land pirate instead of a sea pirate. And so she imagined what Sammy must have been like as a child and created her version of how he became a land pirate. So you see little Sammy, he wants to grow up and be a pirate just like his papa. So he has a whole list of things he's doing to train to be a great sea pirate. And finally he gets to go out on the, the ship with his father and the crew and he gets violently seasick, violently seasick. And no matter what he does, he just can't get over his seasickness. So they get back to land and he realizes he will never grow up to be a pirate like his father. So his father hangs out these lights that night to sort of cheer him up, but he's very, very disappointed. He goes to sleep, but he, when he wakes up in the morning, he notices all these gold coins have washed, washed on shore. And he looks out and there is a ship that has mistaken these lights for the lights in the harbor and has come too close to the coast and crashed and all of its treasure has spilled out and he thinks aha i can be a pirate i will be a land pirate so he creates a list of how he is going to grow up to be a land pirate instead of a sea pirate very funny pair to the umbrella by marianne traori this is the first of two books we are publishing by this author illustrator she lives in africa she teaches school in burkina faso and this is, it has a very traditional African feel to it. It's a story of a boy who is the son of the village chief. They go to the market one day and he buys an umbrella, which isn't the most useful object where he's, where he's living. But he tells the village that they can use this umbrella in any way they see fit. They just have to, re, have to return it to uh, their door when they're finished. So some people do use it on the occasional day that it rains, but other people use it as a walking stick, as a hiding place when they're playing hide and go seek, as a, a weather vane to determine if the winds are strong and so on. It's really quite interesting all the, the ways in which the villagers use this umbrella. You flash forward to the time where now the little boy is grown up and he is the chief of the village and he takes his son to the market and his son buys an object and 
tells the villagers that they too can use this object in any way they see fit. They just have to return it to their father's door when they are finished. And so the reader's left imagining all the wonderful uses this village will have out of this new object that the boy has purchased. Let's Eat Bugs by Mexican author Judy Goldman. She lives in Mexico City. Her son, Ilan, uh, created the photographs, most of the photographs for this book. He is an artist and a photojournalist in Mexico. This is a book obviously about alternate sources of protein. The cover is there to evoke a very strong response. You probably had a very strong response when you saw it. This is the first book I would have picked up as a kid, of course. I just love this photograph that Elon took. But what's great about this book is Judy takes the reader past the initial ick factor that some of them might have about eating bugs and really talks about the history of bugs as a source of protein in Mexico. She talks about the life cycle. She talks about when they're eaten. She shows some dishes where they're eaten. And she talks about their importance, like there are statues in Mexico to some of these bugs. There are holidays in Mexico to some of the, these bugs. So you learn a lot of really rich information and you view the eating of insects in a really unique way and from the perspective of a culture that that commonly eats them and these photographs you can just stare at these photographs for hours because they are so amazing and detailed we uh, the get together we obviously don't have the final cover or art for this but we will have that soon i did share uh a picture that shows what the finished art will look like. This is written by Christine Taylor Butler. She has written dozens and dozens of books for older readers, mostly uh, science books and science fiction books and illustrated by newcomer Lonnie Olivieri, who I think is going to be a huge star in the children's book world. This book is about a get together, much like what we always had where I'm from in the South. The family is getting together on the weekend to celebrate the birthday of Uncle Wesley, who is the patriarch of the family. You see him back here. And the story is told uh, by this little girl. And what's amazing about this story is really the authenticity. You feel like you are spending the day with this family. I always say that this book is about food, family, fighting, and fun. Everything that you would experience in a get together with your family. And the voice is just so incredible. Let me read to you just a couple pages. Cheryl says Linda's hat blocks the sun for miles. You wish Lou looked this good, Linda shouts as she storms across the lawn. She's easy to spot in the crowd. She wears so much eyeshadow when she blinks, it looks like headlights on high beam. Then the little girl and Uncle Wesley go inside and she says, the aroma of sizzling chicken and frying hair float from the kitchen. And Audrey always uses too much grease on both. <laughs> you can't capture family any better than that and the experience that this family has. It is just a pure joy to read. Love on a Plate is our second book by Iranian author illustrator Rashin Carrier. Our first book was the starred review, Bahar the Lucky. In this book, Rasheen wanted to use different materials in a different style from what she normally does. So she wanted to incorporate the use of food. And here you see her taking a photograph of some food. It is a days of the week and Mother's Day book. So this mother fox and the baby fox are the main characters in the story. Each day the mother is collecting these materials, well not materials, these food items that she's going to prepare a dish for her son. And you see the plate here and you lift the flap and you discover this wonderful dish she has prepared on the plate. So she has used these food items to create a train. And then the next spread, the little boy imagines what he would do on this train. He would travel to far away places with his friends. And so the book goes through the different days of the week and you discover as you lift the flap, these amazing food items. And at the end, it's the little boy's turn to make a dish for his, his mother because it is Mother's Day. This is a book I think young readers will really love. Saving Granddaddy's Stories was our first book in our Storyteller series. The second book, She Sang for the Mountains, tells the story of Gene Ritchie. Uh, Saving Granddaddy's Stories was the story of Ray Hicks, who's known as the vo voice of Appalachia. He told those uh, jack tales like Jack and the Beanstalk, and you see some of the art below. She Sang for the Mountains is about singer, songwriter, and activist Gene Ritchie, who wrote a lot of protest songs about strip mining, things that were really important to me growing up in West Virginia. The third book, which will be coming out, is a book about quilt makers and the stories that uh, 
rural Southern women making quilts tell through their quilts. And these are all illustrated by Sophie Page, written by Shannon Hitchcock, in this beautiful 3D found material kind of way that I love. Now on to some of our middle grade books. One Land, Many Nations is a part of a series we are creating. This is the first volume in the series. It is a flip book. So you read it from one side and you read about one nation, you flip it over, you read it from the other side and you read about another nation. When I first started Raycraft Books and I reached out to a bunch of Native American authors and illustrators, one of the things that really bubbled up to the surface is that many people think of Native Americans as past tense. They don't know that they still exist. And they also don't understand that they live on tribal lands that are sovereign nations. So if you go to what we call the state of Oklahoma, you will not only find the state of Oklahoma, you will find the Cherokee Nation, which is its own sovereign nation with its own government, its own laws. And the citizens of the Cherokee Nation have dual citizenship in their nation and in the United States. So I found well-known writers from each nation to take children on a tour of their, of their nation. So Tracy Sorrell is an award-winning Cherokee writer. She is a, a new star in the children's book community. And she tells the story of the Cherokee nation. So you, you hear a little bit about the history, some of their famous uh, citizens like Mary Golda Ross, who was, who helped to create the first rockets that went to the moon about their daily life, their tribal government. You hear some traditional stories, learn some words in Cherokee and so on. And then Lee Francis IV wrote about his nation, the Laguna Pueblo Nation. And he also owns a publishing house that creates Native American comic books. So these are, are people who, who will be known in the children's book community. The second volume features a Carol Lindstrom, whose book, We Are Water Protectors, just won the Caldecott Award, and also Naomi Cal Caldwell. We will have several volumes in this series. Carlos Gomez Freestyle's Heavy on the Style is our first middle grade graphic novel by Chuck Gonzalez, who grew up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. As he says, one of the only non-white families. This book is about intersectionality, Latinx and LGBTQ. It is about a family, Mexican family that has moved into this new town. It starts out Carlos, who is the main character, who is, who is the youngest sibling and his, his two older siblings get the report cards. The father calls them in and is very disappointed and says they need to be more like Mexicans than Mexicans. So it starts out very, very funny, lovely family story, but it deals with some important issues like racism as they move to this new, this new town and also, um, uh, Carlos is a boy who is more feminine than a lot of the boys around him. He is entering this talent contest where he's going to be riding in the BMX show, but he's a little scared of riding his bike. So there's a lot of humor also in this wonderful book. Sunakali, the Messi of the Himalayas, is the biography of a young girl from Nepal who was playing soccer in the mountains with her friends and a soccer coach discovered her, put her on a team, and she has become this incredible teen soccer player. A documentary was made about her life. You see a photograph of her here. And so this picture book was written to share her talents with the, the world. I think a lot of young readers, especially young girls who love soccer will be fascinated by her story. They call her the Messi of the Himalayas because Messi is her favorite soccer player. When she plays, she carries a photograph of him smiling in her pocket as motivation. Dolly Madison, The White House and the Big Tornado was co-written by Alice Boynton and Wiley Blevins and illustrated by Massimiliano Di Laura, who is a finalist for this year's Bologna Ragazzi Award. It's very interesting how timely this book is now. It covers two days in the War of 1812. And recently when the Capitol was stormed on January 6th, people were talking about the last time the Capitol was stormed was during the War of 1812. That first day when the British came and attacked DC, people know about that. They also know the story of that day where Dolly Madison chopped down the painting, the famous painting of George Washington and whisked it off to safety. That story has been told 
throughout generations and has become a bit of a myth. The, the retelling isn't entirely accurate and we do talk about that in the book, but they don't know what happened the second day. So the second day when the British returned to complete their destruction of DC, a terrible storm hits and the, the torrential rains put out most of the fires, which saves a lot of DC and it spawns a tornado. And the British had never seen a tornado. It, not only does it kill some of them, it completely freaks them out. They gather the things, they hightail it out of DC and say they will never return. So it's a really fascinating story. It's told in these uh, dueling stories from each side. So Alice and I read diary entries, letters and autobiographies by all these people involved. Dolly Madison, one of her friends, um, a, a, an enslaved person who worked in the White House, Paul Jennings, soldiers on both sides, teen soldiers, the generals, and so on. So you get a firsthand account of these two days. And the entire book is illustrated in red, white, and blue. And the colors mean something as you go throughout the book, except when the storm hits, obviously, it is all in black. Storm Warning by Elizabeth Rahm is another middle grade novel. It's based on the actual events of a 1997 blizzard. And you see here below how the house is completely covered by the snow that quickly melts and turns into this horrible flood. This uh, particular author, Elizabeth, was an eyewitness to this event. And so she created a story about a boy whose father is a, a Vietnam War vet. He's trying to prove himself to his father. The storm is starting, but the father has to whisk his mother off to the hospital to have a baby. So he is left taking care of his younger sister. His grandmother lives next door. So he has to keep an eye on her as well. But then in the middle of the storm, she disappears. So he has all of this responsibility. He's trying to find his grandmother, take care of his little sister, trying to prove himself <clears throat> to his father. And the story ensues. A lot of drama and just a wonderful family story. Soroya and the Dragon is the second book in our Soroya series. The first book was Soroya and the Mermaid, written by Salima Ali Khan, illustrated by Atiye Sarabi and Jennifer Nalchigar. This is a, a series about a fourth grade girl who goes on these field trips with her class and gets into these wonderful, magical adventures. In the first book, she helps to save a mermaid. In the second book, they go to these caverns where she encounters a dragon. What's special about this book is in the back of each of these, there is a comic book insert illustrated by Soroya herself that young readers really will love. And we have also published the seventh book in our Magic Mirror series. If you have not checked out this series, please do. It's written by Luther Tse and Nuri Vitachi. These two Asian siblings are searching for their grandfather using this magic mirror that enables them to travel back in time. Magic mirrors are an actual object that you can find in museums around Asia that are uh, reported to have these magical qualities. And in the seventh book, the adventure continues in a really exciting way. You have this time travel adventure, but you learn a lot about Asian history, things about the Great Wall, uh, Genghis Khan and other, other important places and people in history that children in the US would also know a little bit about and be excited to learn more about. A really exciting series, fast read that we hope that you will, that you will take a look at. As you know, we have a partnership with a publishing house in China. And so we do bring some licensed titles to the United States from that publishing house. One of these books is called The Second Race of Rabbit and Tortoise. You all know Aesop's fable, The Tortoise and the Hare. This book asks the question, what happens the next day when the, the rabbit who has been humiliated wants a rematch? And it is a, a story about learning from your mistakes and persevering and uh, making amends for your, your past wrongdoings. I love the art in this book. I've been to China many times, including Chengdu, where they raise the pandas and seeing a panda bear holding a camera in this book makes me more joyous than it should. This book is, this book, I think teachers will really love this book when they're talking about retellings of popular tales or extensions of popular tales. It fits right into a lot of curricular uh, units as well. Gray Bunny's Great Adventure is another book from China that has a very classic golden book kind of feel. It's a story of a mama bunny and her baby bunnies. She's taking them 
into the forest to visit their grandmother. The youngest bunny is blind. And so she tells them, you know, stick together. The forest can be a dangerous place and, and we'll get to grandma's just fine. So as they're traveling, they have to cross a little stream and the, little, the littlest bunny who is blind gets swept away. So she's trying to find her, her mom and brothers. And the forest animals and forest plants are helping her along the way, but then the forest grows silent. And then she starts hearing the pitter patter of feet running in all directions. And the next thing she feels is this lick and it's a wolf. And as a reader, you're absolutely terrified. You turn the page and you find out that the wolf is a mama wolf who is looking for her baby wolf who has wandered off and finds out that the, that the bunny is looking for her mom. And so they decide to team up and find their, their, their family. And it's this wonderful, surprising, really touching friendship story. Two other books by China, a Summer Night Concert is a poetry book about uh, the, the season of summer told through the perspective of the plants and animals that uh, live during the season. It's very lyrical, gorgeous. Uh, and older readers will really appreciate it. And I want to is a, another one of these philosophical books where these two children are wondering what they want to do when spring arrives. They're very eager for spring. And the little girl wants to grow a dress of green grass and wildflowers and grow with the flower buds showering in sunbeams. It's very poetic, very gorgeous. Uh, illustrations are stunning. And it's also a book that really sparked the imagination of young readers. I want to share with you some books that are coming up to get you excited about some of the books we're currently working on beyond our summer list. We have brought in some really exciting authors and illustrators and, and titles. One of these is called Grandma's Hand by Kelly Starling Lyons. She is having one of these tremendous years in the, the trade book world. She just won a Geisel uh, uh, honor. And uh, this book is illustrated by Tanya Engels, who is a phenomenal artist. And it's a story of uh, grandma and her, her grandchild. So it's one of these gorgeous intergenerational stories where they are cooking together. And this, the book starts out, grandma's hands knead dough into a smooth ball that will rise like magic. I look at my hands and wonder if they will ever move like hers. Grandma places the dough into a grease bowl I cover with a cloth. Making bread takes time, she says. So we sit and wait. We sit and talk. Her hands tell a story, if you listen. And so begins this, this wonderful family story. The second book is called The Legend of the Spirit Serpent. It is a traditional tale told on the island of Dominica by the Kalinago people. We sponsored the first annual Caribbean Writers Contest with, uh, in partnership with the Ducre Foundation. We got all these manuscripts, we evaluated them, chose a winner, and lo and behold, much to our surprise, the winner was a nine-year-old indigenous girl from the island of Dominica. And this isn't even her first book. This is her second book, Adia Sanford. She is going to have a phenomenal career in children's books. We searched high and low for the perfect Caribbean illustrator. We found one who we loved, who we thought could bring something really magical to this modern retelling of this traditional story, but this illustrator was busy until 2023. So we sent it out to a bunch of agents and Ken Daly saw the story and he wrote us right away and said, this book is mine. I am illustrating this book. I am originally from the island of Dominica. I grew up hearing the story. I am the one who should illustrate it. So we are super excited about this book and about the pairing of author and illustrator and to celebrate the winner of our first annual Caribbean Writers Contest. We are doing a couple really funny commercial books with Ed Massessa. He does a lot of books with Scholastic. One of the books is called Snowman's Big Adventure. The other is There Was an Old Dog Who Needed a Nap. And this book, it just makes me laugh every time I read it. It's this conversation between this girl and a snowman and then a dragon appears and, and, and so on. And you can see some of the, the text here on a hot summer night. You know, the girl's telling him the beginning of her story and the snowman's like, this story's off to a bad start. The girl says, well, it's my story, but I'll start over on a cold, dreadful night. Snowman, that's better. Wait, why is it dreadful? 
girl, a night so bitterly cold, the snowman turned blue and icicles were shivering in their boots. And then you see this illustration of icicles and cowboy boots. Snowman, okay, it doesn't have to be that cold, girl. A night so cold that the snowman's tutu froze to his belly. Snowman, I'm not wearing a, hey, wait, why am I wearing a tutu? And you, you just see just how funny this story is going to be. We're really thrilled by, by these two books, bringing something very commercial and very humorous to our line at Raycraft Books. We have a new transitional chapter book series written by Winsome, Winsome Bingham called For Good Series. Winsome is a disabled war veteran. She fought in Desert Storm. She was a student of mine at Highlights, and we were talking about her time in service and how she raised her son on a military base. <clears throat> I was also born on a military base, and we were sort of surprised that neither one of us could think of any books that honors military families or shows military life in any way. And so I asked Winsome if she would write this uh, transitional chapter book series for us. And it's a, a family that's moving on to a new base. The little boy's name is Lang, and adventures that he has with his group of friends. You get an experience of what it's like to live on a military base, both the good and sometimes the, the challenging moments of living on a base. Here are some texts from one of the stories in the first book where Lang hasn't started school yet and he's telling his new group of friends what his teacher was like at his old school. Lang laughed. My favorite time was when she cracked a coconut. We thought milk was coming out of it. It didn't, Ying asked. Lang shook his head. Cracking coconut in the classroom, said Carlos. Lang nodded. You won't do that here, Carlos said. Nope, not here, said George. Yeah, no, said Ying. So what do you do here, asked Lang. Wait, what, milk doesn't come out of coconuts, Ying said. No, water comes out of a coconut, said Lang. Water, water, said George. No, coconut water, said Lang. I bet he telling stories, said Carlos. Yep, he tells the story, said George. <laughs> and so the, he takes his, his friends to his, his mama who's sitting on the front porch and wants to use one of her coconuts. And she's like, baby, you are not cracking open my coconut to prove to your friends that you're telling the truth. It's just so real. It's so beautiful. And it, it really honors military families in a way I've never seen in young books and super, super coming from a military family. I'm super thrilled that we are able to bring these books to the world. We have a new book coming out by Joseph Broshak. You know his works already. He did our Powwow Mystery Series and Wolf Cub Song. This book is a poetry anthology. Joe started out as a poet. And so what he has done is he has taken 34 famous Native Americans, some of whom readers will know, like Pocahontas or Sequoia, Sacagawea, Wilma Mankiller, and others that they won't know but really should. And he writes a poem that captures the essence of their life. They're absolutely gorgeous poems. And all of these poems are illustrated by current contemporary Native American artists. So we're not only celebrating these famous Native Americans of the past through Joe's rich poetry, but we're also highlighting and celebrating the great artistic talent in the Native American community today. I think this is a book that every library and every classroom will want to have. And we are doing a book with the famous Jane Yolen. It's an immigration story called Straw Bag, Tin Box, Cloth Suitcase, Three Immigrant Stories. There are three immigrant stories told simultaneously by Jane and two other writers that she worked with. One is escaping persecution in Iran and the other is, is traveling to the United States from Central America. And in the beginning, one immigrant grabs a straw bag to throw their belongings in, one a tin box and one a cloth suitcase. And it's a really fascinating look at the immigrant experience and some of the commonalities across people traveling to the United States to find a better life. So that is a sneak peek at our spring summer 2021 list, as well as some books that we are currently work working on that I know you will be eager to get into your hands. Please take a look at our website, www.raycraftbooks.com to find out about some of our past award-winning and starred review books and, and all of our offerings. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this preview and feel free to, to write us with any questions that you have or anything that you want to know more about. Thank you so much.